Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. My friend David Zills, the apologist, is back. How you doing? I am <clears throat> doing okay. A little congested for some reason, but it seems to come with the season. Yeah, it's 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 that uh, time of year, uh, the most wonderful time of the year, which is my favorite song to sing whenever my children fight in front of me, uh, because I've got a case of the irony. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we are uh, we're 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 talking about miracles. And um, this was sort of the one that I almost wanted to lead with because every pastor out here has to sort of immediately sort of put up hands as soon as we start talking about miracles, because sometimes the miracles don't happen. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's a tough one. And we've talked about the role of miracles and how they show God's love. And so Mm -hmm. does that mean when a God doesn't do a miracle, he doesn't love us? And so this is, this is a, this is a big one. So I think, you know, we spent quite a bit of time making a case for miracles that they do happen. They are real, not just that they did happen and that they can happen, but that they do and that they lower the burden of proof for the new Testament. Because if, if these things are happening today, um, then why not believe that they happen, that Jesus did these things in the Gospels? There's no reason to treat the Gospels with extra skepticism. But as soon as you start talking about miracles, there's kind of the philosophical side of, is it rational to believe these things just from an evidence perspective? But then there's this other side of, well, how do we make sense of the way miracles do or do not happen? And so... There are two big objections that come up, and last time we dealt with one of them, which is what about miracles in other religions? And, you know, we were, we talked about how Christianity is very upfront about the fact that both God and other spirits, even deceitful spirits, could be acting supernaturally in contexts outside of where his, you know, you know, where Christian people are, or in the Old Testament where the Jewish people were. Um, and so, that kind of raises this view of the supernatural world where you can't just blindly believe it, but you have to test the spirits because not all of them might be acting in your best interest. And I think the best criteria when there's all these spiritual claims out there, the best criteria for sifting through that is who is Jesus? And this is where we'll get in the new year. Is, is he uh, just a good teacher? Is he something more than that? Um, and, and that's where I think if you can make a case for who is Jesus, like one of my Muslim friends said, he said, you know, if Jesus, if you can show with evidence that Jesus is the son of God and that he rose from the dead, then case closed. You know, that gives you a criterion for sifting through all these spiritual claims out there. Um, so that was last time. This time, I think there's a, there's a bigger one, one that is a little heavier because it's something we all experience, which is when we pray for God to intervene and he doesn't, what do we do with that? Yeah, this stops being philosophical real quick and it gets to be emotional because uh, the, the times where we're looking for these, it, it, it's not, hey, God, you know, just I would really, I think it'd be cool to get a grilled cheese with your face on it. But the the miracles that that we uh, we pray for and we we go without they're they're the healing ones almost every time they're the the save me ones and yeah what does that look like when god says no um, yeah and i i think like you said there's a huge emotional side of that i think that's where we have to go ultimately but there is a bit of an intellectual side um and so i think let's start there just to kind of clear kind of the theological framework um, and i think there are two things that can be said intellectually about when miracles don't happen one of them is going to sound harsh, but it's important because, you know, that there's this feeling of, is God somehow sinning by not intervening? Is God somehow in the wrong, which is the whole point of the book of Job? You know, Job is ha, suffers a whole bunch and God allows it. And Job is saying, how, how, are you, how can you do this, God? And is God somehow in the wrong? And, and you know, when you look at the storyline of scripture, God doesn't owe us anything, you know, because of our rejection of him and our desire to put ourselves in charge of our life. God doesn't owe us anything. And so God is nowhere unjust because he doesn't intervene. In fact, if he does intervene, it's out of his mercy, not his justice. And so from the standpoint of God's justice, there is no intellectual issue with miracles that don't happen. Um, or more broadly, the problem of evil, the problem of pain and suffering, which is probably one of the number one topics in the philosophy of religion when it comes to the existence of God. 
Um, so, so God is clear when it comes to justice, but what about God's mercy? Because the, the, the good news of Christianity is that not only is God just, but he's also merciful. And the only way he can be fully just and fully merciful is in the cross where Jesus assumes the debt that we couldn't pay and pays it for us as God and therefore clears God's justice so that God is able to show us mercy. Um, and the question is, where is God's mercy in all this? And I think one thing um, at an intellectual level, it's important to know what miracles are and what they are not. And the storyline of scripture is that God out of his mercy is in the process of setting right what has gone wrong with the world. You know, everyone has this intuition that something has gone wrong. And we may not have a philosophical or theological framework to explain why or how things have gone wrong, but there's this deep intuition that this is not the way things should be. And Christianity is very affirming that that intuition is exactly correct. Things should be different. And God is in the process of setting them back to the way they should be. So the, it's important to know what is miracles role in God's redemptive plan. And the key is that miracles are not God's primary means of setting wrong, setting right what has gone wrong. The primary means is we're, we're in Advent is when Jesus came the first time to to satisfy God's justice and to open the door for God's mercy on the cross. And then in the resurrection, it's the down payment, I like to think, of God's final restoration of all things, because Jesus was born, was, was uh, resurrected permanently, never to die again. He's in an immortal state like we will be, and it's kind of the down payment of what God will do at the end of time. And so there's so miracles point back to who Jesus was, and they also point forward to what God will do in the second coming when there's a new heaven and a new earth and everything will be set right. And so we're in this in-between stage. You know, sometimes theologians will call it the already not yet, where God has already started to set things right in the cross and empty tomb, but it's not yet complete, like it will be on the last day. And so miracles point back to what Jesus did and forward to what Jesus will do. You know, we've talked about miracles as signs. It, you know, when you're driving down the road and a sign says bridges out, the point is not to look at the sign and be like, huh, I like that paint job on that sign. The point is the bridge is out. It's trying to draw your attention to something else. And that's what miracles are there. It's not about the miracle. They're trying to draw our attention to something beyond the miracle, which is the reality that God's heart is to set all things right. And so but miracles are not the way he has chosen to do that in this in-between stage between the the already and the not yet. Um, yeah, so that's just the intellectual framework. Where do miracles fit within God's justice and God's mercy? And I think that's a good place to start, but we definitely can't stop there because it doesn't satisfy what I just said when you're in the middle of a miracle that doesn't happen and you're devastated. Right. From there, we kind of have to pick it up and we almost have to start to talk about what it looks like down here and and, and whether or not that's sort of the, the be all end all, because I, I get it. Like um, my kids build a sandcastle and they just want the thing to endure forever. Um, but the tide is going to come and, and take it away. Um, God could heal. God could raise the dead. He has in the past, but even in the scriptures, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, it's, it's pretty well uh, uh, attested to that Lazarus who was raised from the dead was martyred later. Um, that, that even, uh, you know, the, the people who, who were raised, uh, the Jairus's daughter who was raised, she's not still around. Um, the tide is going to come back. And so if, if all of your emotional investment in this moment can only be satiated by something that's only going to break again, we have to acknowledge that's not enough. We, we sort of need our eyes lifted up and, and pointed at something more. Um, and if that were going to be the only thing, the only way to, to sustain that would be to stop the tide, would be to stop the forces of destruction, would be to, well, get rid of every sinner in the world who's making things worse and never, ever, ever sin again yourself. And if that's sort of the place where you want to leave your miracle, like I can have this one thing if I never, ever, 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 ever mess up or even think about messing up or I'm messed up against again then it'll be okay. That's, that's poor odds. We, we don't want to play that game, but where's Jesus to console us when? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think you said it well, when you said, you know, anyone who's raised from the dead or who is healed eventually dies. And so the mere, all the miracles that happen now are temporary fixes. They're not the final 
fix. They're not a permanent fix. And so that's why we do have to look elsewhere. And so I think, you know, but but what where do we go when 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 the the tough things happen, um, when heartbreak happens, when loss happens and grief? And I think two play, I think there's a lot that could be said about this. And you could spend a whole month or two just delving into the problem of pain and suffering and where is God and all that. But I think two things that could be said at the outset are about God's purpose and God's presence in the midst of suffering. And um, so I'll try to break those down. The purpose bit, you know, I've heard it said that people are not as afraid of suffering as they are of pointless suffering. You know, there's this idea if you suffer and it's for a good cause, there can be this sense that somehow it's worth it. But if you suffer and there's literally no point, that's the part that's devastating. And I think, you know, one of the cool promises in scripture from Romans 8, Romans 8 is a great chapter um, in the New Testament to talk about about this. There are a lot of amazing things that it says about pain and suffering. And one of the things is that in all things, God works for good for those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. So there's this sense that when God allows suffering, he's working behind the scenes to bring good out of it. Um, and I know I experienced something very difficult about three years ago that really rocked me. Um, and within the last couple months, I've learned some things that I didn't know about that event. Um, and then I have had this sense that, huh, that was actually for the best. And in some ways it was all worth it. I, um, it was hard, but when it turns out for good, there's this sense after the fact that there, there's kind of this satisfaction. I think C.S. Lewis wrote that, um, you know, mere mortals have a hard time with the idea that suffering can be for good because they don't realize that in heaven, the restoration of all things will work retroactively is how he said, and it'll set all things right all the way back through all the pain and suffering, and it'll redeem all those things. And that's another passage from Romans 8, which is that our present suffering cannot compare with the glory that is to be revealed, you know, in the final restoration of all things. And so I think there's this hope that it's not in vain. It's not pointless suffering, that God is using everything for good. And that can bring a lot of comfort. The difficult thing is we don't always see that good. You know, I was able to see some good over the stuff that happened to three years ago, but not that doesn't always happen. And so there's got to be more even than that. But I think I think that's a key piece of it is God's purpose in suffering. Sometimes it's to change us to make us better. Sometimes it's to equip us for something that he has for us afterward, where we'll be able to do things or to touch people's lives in ways that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, sometimes it's to spare us because by that happening, he actually saved us from something far worse. A lot of times we don't know what his purposes are, and that's the hard part. Right. Um, and, and so when we go into God's hidden will this way, um, honestly, our, our confessions tell us just stop. Um, there's a place like when you're in the middle of the pain, you're not going to be able to figure it out. It hurts too much to actually think clearly. You might catch glimpses of it down the road. And, and thanks be to God for that. He's merciful enough to show us that he worked this for good. But when we, we cannot ascertain God's hidden well, when we can't figure out why it hurts so bad, um, this is where we actually get to look to God's revealed will. We get to look to the cross of Christ, that his, his will is to actually use suffering for salvation, and we get to see it in the person of Jesus. Jesus suffered to save you, and it is, it's your hope to be crucified with Jesus, that you would be raised with him in your baptism. We get to sort of say, crosses hurt. It, it's not fun. Nobody liked it. Jesus didn't like it, but there's salvation done in suffering. And so if you are suffering, God must be nearby because ours is the God who draws near to suffering. Ours is the God who uses suffering for salvation. He suffers for you. And so if, if, yourself, if your suffering is just an, an echo of the suffering that, that he is, has suffered for you, well, thanks be to God that you already know how this ends, because if, if you hurt, well, he who hurt rose, you and Christ will rise too. I think that's powerful is the idea that God suffers too. In fact, if Jesus is God and if the cross is what Christians claim, 
then God in Jesus suffered more than we will ever have to so that we would never have to suffer like that. And so there's the sense that, you know, um, in the coming year, we'll talk about the title of Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. There's the sense that God is with us in the suffering. And so that's the second piece I want to talk about, not just God's purpose, but God's presence, which is that God not only has entered into our suffering in Jesus, but that he's with us in all of our individual sufferings. And sometimes that's really the thing that we need when we can't make sense of it, is that God is there. He cries with us. He's His heart breaks with us at the brokenness that we're experiencing in this world. And that presence of God can sometimes mean more than all the questions we want answered. You know, sometimes we want to know why or how does this make sense or all these things. And sometimes those questions, even if we had them, wouldn't really help because the thing that we need is someone to say, really just give us a hug and say, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going anywhere. And I think that applies to, you know, when someone comes to us with their suffering, how we as people can respond. So often it's easy to want to fix it, even by things that we say to try to make sense of it. But that's really one of the worst things you can do. So one of the best things you can do is be with someone in their suffering and just sit with them. You know, I, I think about the book of Job and, you know, it said that Job's three friends, the best thing they did in the whole book was sit down with Job for like a week or I don't know how long it was and not say anything like that was the high point. And then they opened their mouths and tried to start making sense of it. And it was downhill from there. And the thing that ultimately satisfied Job is when God showed up, he gave his presence and he basically said, you're not going to know the answer. You're not going to get the answer. You can't, but I'm here. And that's when Job was satisfied. And, you know, that's the story of, of the cross, really. You put God's purpose and his presence together in the cross, which is God enters into our suffering presence in order to redeem us from it or through it, which is the purpose. And that's where Christianity offers a lot that other worldviews don't. You know, what other God does that? Um, you know, and I think something worth saying is that the problem of pain and evil and suffering is, is a problem for any worldview. It doesn't go away if you become atheist. Arguably, it becomes worse because now you have no standard by which to call evil evil. You have no standard of justice. Because if, if if this world is just a bunch of atoms and molecules, then pain is just part of it. And there's no reason for you to object to it. It's just the way it is. And there's nobody out there who can comfort you. You just got to kind of buckle up and do your best. And so um, arguably, it's a bigger problem for atheism than it is for Christianity. And and the remarkable thing about Christianity is that at its core, it's a God who suffers for us and with us. And I think that is ultimately um, where we have to go. Um, one of my pastors growing up said, if you want to know if God loves you, don't look at your circumstances because you're not going to be able to understand all the factors at play that God is working if you want to know God's heart for you, look at the cross. And if you want to know God's power for you, look at the empty tomb. Those are the definitive proofs of God's love and of God's power. And just like he was with us to do those things, he's with us in the moment when we're suffering to comfort us and to redeem what we're going through. Right. This is what theologians call the theology of the cross versus the theology of glory. Um, the idea that that um, a, a God's presence means things must hurt less has nothing to do with the cross where Jesus died for you. Um, but the idea that that God suffered for you, it, it means that when there is pain in the world, we're not going to mark it as an abandonment of God, but, but simply one of those places where he works. If you have gone without a miracle, you have not gone without a Jesus who died for you. In fact, that Jesus who died for you rose for you and has already promised you that salvation, that hope. So if you're waiting for your miracle, it's already paid for. It's just that it's it's not time yet. And I disagree with the timing of it too. You're allowed to disagree with the timing of it. But one of the great things when we when we actually cling to the theology of the cross instead of just a theology of glory, that things just have to feel good and get better all the time, is that 
when when it's i don't know the sun is blotted out from the sky and there's hurt everywhere and jesus cries out it is finished we can actually call it a good friday and not just sort of a weird ending to a book of a handful of miracles for people that weren't you um inside of all of it uh we look for jesus and so i, I love what you said david about uh the, the road signs that that point the bridge is out let's let's take knowledge of this, this is something has changed that that's worth paying attention to i think that's good all right. David, thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Sounds good. Talk to you next time.